This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 88. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. But first, before we get started, let's talk about our great sponsors. 1791 Gun Leather is the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, and they'd like you to know their appreciation for the Second Amendment fuels their passion for gun leather and its representation of the original patriots of this great nation. 100% certified American steer hide joins four generations of professional leather artisans to create the perfect firearms holster. Carry your firearm with pride knowing that each 1791 gun leather holster is handcrafted to be the best holster for your firearm. See their full product lineup at 1791gunleather.com. The supporting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is Hodgden Powder. Available in granular powder and pellets, Hodgden's family of 777 powders gives muzzleloading enthusiasts a quick cleaning, low odor black powder substitute for rifle and pistol applications. To learn more, visit Hodgden.com. Well, if you've been asked to take people out and teach them how to shoot, even though you're not a certified firearms instructor, this episode is for you. Today, I invite Gunsight CEO Ken Campbell into my home studio to give some great tips on how to be a good instructor and teacher, even if you've not had formal training on the subject. Now, here's Ken Campbell on becoming a DIY instructor. Ken, thanks for joining us here in the world headquarters of the Guns Magazine podcast, which happens to be my my home office. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> I was promised bourbon, Brett. <laughs> bourbon. <laughs> no, I, I thought this would be a great time to talk since you are you are my house guest this week, and we're Very enjoying that. that. But uh, yeah, I, I drug you here in my office uh, on the evening. We're both really tired, but this was a pretty important topic I wanted to talk about, and. Most folks know you are the CEO of Gunsight Academy, the world's oldest and largest private shooting school, and you've trained tens of thousands of people, and that is a big topic. We've talked about how new shooters can can find some training, but today I wanted to address the folks that uh, probably are going to be the first trainers a lot of people experience. I mean, it's great if folks buy a gun, come to Gunsight, and learn how to use it. That's optimal, but I think we would all agree that's that's a rare situation. Usually somebody buys a gun and they call their neighbor, grandpa, uncle, you know. And I wanted to address the folks that will be the ones taking new shooters out. You know, you've trained countless people and you've trained countless trainers also. So we thought this would be a great topic for you to address to all those dads, grandpas, neighbors, friends Aunt out there. Uncles. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what do you think is the, the biggest issue when non-professional trainers take folks out for the first time, especially? Okay. First of all, be real honored, they ask you. Right? These folks have taken a huge step in their life. They may not be gun people at all, but now they've realized the world may not be the panacea they once thought it was, and, and they've taken a huge step and they bought a gun. Or they've come to you and say, what gun do I buy? And I want you to teach me how to shoot. Yep. So that that's a great honor. Exactly. And that's a great opportunity for you. Don't screw it up. <laughs> right? Don't be that guy that puts a airweight 357 in their hands and lets them try that the first time yeah. or the, the six inch 44 Magnum. No, don't 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 do that. Let's ease these folks along here so they can realize this is great fun. Yes, it's a massive amount of responsibility, and yes, I can protect myself and my family. But let's let them have some fun as they learn first. So recognize the honor, recognize the huge responsibility. Make sure you do a little bit of homework yourself. No, nothing really exotic. Remember, if this isn't Army basic training like you had back in the big war or what you've seen on the Internet in some of those less than reputable <laughs> websites. Um, so do a little bit of homework there. Start with the very basics. How about the four safety rules? Right. Right. Let, let's just start with that. Four 
simple safety rules you can ingrain into their, make that an everyday part of their consciousness. And that's a really great way to start. And I think, you know, that's, that's a great point. If the person taking them out can't say them from memory, maybe you're not quite ready to introduce a new shooter. Right. So we, sometimes we see folks that tend to gloss over that, and that is the foundation of everything you do in shooting from, from point A to point double Z. Right. It, you can never get too much of the basics. You can absolutely never be too safe. And those Colonel Cooper distilled them down to four simple points that work. You basically have to violate two of them for a tragedy to occur. Yep. So get yourself ingrained in that. Then do a lot of dry practice with the folks. You know, ammunition still, it, it's down. Prices are down. Yeah. And it's a little more available. But before you start spending money on ammunition, start doing dry practice. And there's a regiment you need to learn about in there to make sure they're doing dry practice properly. Safe backstop, the gun's unloaded, there's no distractions. And then you have them practice with their gun, pressing that trigger through, holding the sights motionless when that hammer falls or the striker goes forward. And then they're learning the manipulations of either pressing that double action trigger or running the slide uh, to get it back into, into battery unloaded. So they're practicing dry. So there's no recoil. So there's, there's no flinching involved. So you're building some comfort level with them and their chosen gun. Then you can take the next step into making it go bang. If you've got something in like 22 caliber, that's not a bad idea at all, especially with these novice folks. Yeah. They, they, uh, their anxiety level is pretty high. They may have been that person of, there'll never be a gun in my <laughs> house, to realizing we've defunded the police. I got to protect myself. Yeah. So they've overcome that, yet that anxiety is still there. They're expecting, being what they've read in some of the mainstream media, that this gun is going to just be like dynamite going off in their hands. So if you can get your hands on a 22 revolver, a, a 22 semi-automatic pistol, start with that. And then start working on those fundamentals of marksmanship. You know, bring that gun up to eye level. Teach them how the sights work or the red dot works. Get them to press that trigger. Ease to reset. Refocus on that front sight. The fundamentals. Don't try to turn them into a steely-eyed dealer of death. Doc Holiday in the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Just patience is, is, is so good. And, and do it over half a dozen sessions. Don't try to do, let's do an eight-hour day. Well, some people's attention spans <laughs> yeah. are eight minutes. Yeah. And so you got to read that, too. So start with those safety rules that you can recite without reading it off your cheat sheet. Get them to practice that. Do dry practice. Then ease into with smaller calibers, and then into whatever their gun happens to be. Don't fire hundreds and hundreds around. You get a diminishing return. Now, when you've finished with your hour session, never finish on something bad. Finish on something good. Yep. So that when they leave, they're like, oh, I got this. And then think about what you want to do on your next session. First off, you want to review everything you just did. Start with those four safety rules. That's what we do at Gunsight in a lot of the classes. The range master will say, all right, Brent, what's rule number one? Bill, what's rule number two? Yep. Sally, what's rule number three? So that gets ingrained into them. Then you briefly go over. So you do your dry practice again. And then you go over some of the steps you did before. And then you add a couple more things. Think of this as a marathon, not a sprint. You know, it, I'm always reminded of our late friend, Louis Arbuck, that always said, there's no such thing as an advanced gunfight, only the fundamentals under more stress. Uh, pressure, stress. And I think many non-professional trainers, which is what you will be, you will be a trainer uh, if, if you're taking somebody to the range, especially for the first time. And I think sometimes they feel like they have to make them Doc Holiday within the first 15 minutes. And it truly, the great shooters uh, the Jerry Mishlicks of the world and, and all the others that I could name drop, they do the fundamentals. They practice them over and over and over. Until they can't get it wrong. Exactly. And they've gotten it wrong more times than you and I have ever gotten it right. Correct. Because that's, that's what they do. They, they focus on it. I've seen 
Rob Latham. I've seen, I've seen you know, all, yeah. all these shooters that do these things, and they do it over and over. They spend an inordinate amount of time dry practicing also. Yep. So it doesn't have to go bang. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but just take measured steps as it goes along. This is, this is an interesting topic that this comes up quite a bit in training, is the ladies. Um, you've trained, we both trained countless ladies. We've, we've trained them in our ladies only classes together, which was eye opening. And ladies, we know you're just as bad as we are when you get in groups, but I am reminded of the comment that, uh, my former boss, Roy Huntington's wife, Susie, who is pretty well known in the industry, former cop. She's a tremendous shooter. She's a hunter. And she told me one time that her biggest complaint is don't treat her like she's stupid. And yep. that's funny because Susie is anything but stupid, but we've all seen it. And we could tell one story that we won't tell here where we witnessed that, where some guys were, you know, kind of belittling the ladies. And it, it really, again, I don't think they even understood how badly that scarred these really nervous right. ladies that were just getting started. Right. It, it just, it just turns them completely away from it. And honestly, in, in my experience and our experience at Gunsight and so on, women are better students than men are <laughs> they are <laughs> we have all this machismo we, we oh, instruction manual we don't need that you know it's in <laughs> it's instinctive to us well, yeah. and, and suckling is instinctive right to it to an infant shooting is not instinctive but ladies listen and do and their learning curve rockets with guys we got to tell them and tell them or we got to cut a switch off the juniper tree <laughs> get them on the back of the calves or do a gib slap on the back of their head <laughs> to get some of them to pay attention. And I'm not trying to be rude here, but it, it's a man thing. Yeah. So ladies classes are a hoot to teach. Um, the, the dynamic in it is really good. And the, the main comments we get after we do these classes is how empowering it is because they realize, gosh, I can do this. I'm smart enough. I'm strong enough. I'm, I, I, I can do this and I can keep up with our goals when we were teaching these is we want you to outshoot your husband because, oh, we don't need this training. <laughs> you, honey, you go get the yeah. training. Now, l let me suggest this also to these prospective trainers out there. Never teach a spouse to paddle a canoe, drive a stick shift or shoot, or you will end up with a dinner of cold shoulder and, and hot, hot tongue. tongue. <laughs> it, it, it is not conducive yeah. uh, to you. Let somebody else do it. If I've got a husband and wife in a class, I put them on the same relay and I separate them by about six or eight other students so they don't coach each other, they don't intimidate each other, or all come along and say, Shirley, I, why don't you try holding the gun like this, standing like this, and I walk away and the husband goes, well, I don't listen to him, yeah. he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> well, what did you give us all the money for then, yeah. <laughs> right, if, if you're going to completely disregard? So we separate them. Also, I don't want domestic disputes on the firing line when everybody's got guns. That, yeah, that, that tends could, to, that to go downhill. sideways. <laughs> yeah. But no, I think that's a very salient point that uh, sometimes um, husbands especially, I'm going to take you out and teach you how to shoot. Well, that's They'll okay. Listen. They, they, but the, it's, you yeah. don't listen to each other. Yeah, there's going to be a problem at some point. So if you've got a knowledgeable friend or or somebody some of you trust yeah exactly women are a, a, an ever-increasing part of the market whether it's in sales whether it is in training so again this is that perspective trainer that's you people that we're talking to this is your opportunity again not to stick some air weight 357 in their hands yeah but to start them out slow walk before you try to skip or run with them it's 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 a tremendous opportunity especially if they're of a liberal mindset Bring them over from the dark side. You know, and, and I was sitting here just thinking about trainers. And because until I said that a few minutes ago, it, it didn't strike me as these are non-professional trainers. And that's what they are, whether they would call themselves that or not. But I was trying to think of the qualities of a trainer that I respect. And one of the things that I always put about first on my list is being humble enough to say, I don't know. Yes. And again, especially folks that don't, are non-professionals, um, it's sometimes hard to do that. But that's, that's an important facet to say, I don't know how to do that, or I can't do that. Do not, it's called MSU, make stuff up. <laughs> right? I wasn't sure where that was yeah. going. <laughs> no, no, well, what about if with this or that? If you don't know, again, so you said, just say, you know, I don't know, yeah. that, that's out of my pay grade. 
don't just make make stuff up for your answer. Yep. Well, I saw this on Miami Vice. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy for you, Skippy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just and and patience. Yeah. Don't 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 raise your voice. Don't. I mean, I can probably count on. Uh, you know, I've got a large number of students in my background now. On both hands, the times I've really had to raise my voice, and that had to do with safety, safety. issues. Yeah. Right. Simply safety issues, and I'll raise my voice, and I'll immediately go right back into this is when I have a line of students and I'll immediately go right back into whatever patter that that I was doing and then either one of my other coaches will come up or I'll get over to him and say Brent this is what what you're doing here and I had to stop that right then and there so you got to have patience and you've got to be uh all knowing and all seeing uh, not as in all knowing as in again thinking you know it all but you've got to watch for all these little things fingers on the trigger when they're not supposed to be starting to turn around with a gun, bending over with a gun, and some some real fundamental range rules that you've got to ingrain. You you want them to be so safe when you're done training with them that when they go to a public range, they're almost frightened <laughs> because the people there did not get a solid foundation in the basics like they did. Yeah, and you know I think that's an issue. The times I've seen probably some of the most egregious safety problems are among friends and family. Yeah. And I think that vigilance goes away a little bit when you're talking, you know, especially family or, you know, close friends and yeah, old it, buddy, come on, let you and me go out and yeah. and, and uh blast some caps into the into the backstop and it can go south quick. Yeah, there, there's a time for fun. There's a time to have the game face on. Yeah. But when you're doing that, and then once the gun's back in the holster, then okay, well, I really screwed that up or whatever the case may be, but that's after you've gotten the gun put back away again properly. Yep. It, that that comfort zone, it, it can never go away, right? There's there are those, it's sort of like motorcycle riders. There are those that have had an accident. There are those that are going to have an accident. There are those that have had a negligent discharge, and there are those that are going to have one. And every day you go in life without having a negligent discharge is the next day closer to it. Exactly. And that's why you've got to ingrain those four safety rules as the trainer to these folks so that if nothing else, if, if they get nothing else out of the class or the time you're spending with them, they'll come away safe. You know, I was just sitting here thinking, I can't remember what your student to coach ratio is, but it's probably a lot lower than what people realize. And I was going to make the point that if you don't do this regularly, you probably shouldn't take more than one person at a time, two at tops, and only have one shooting at a time. I, I agree. At, at Gunsight, we use a one-to-four ratio, one instructor for four students on the firing line. Now, we've got instructors. Our instructors have decades of experience, yeah. so it's not like we're bringing in somebody who bought his membership this week and the <laughs> Platinum Club member or whatever. The, these folks are real-world people. As Jeff Cooper said, they've seen the elephant. And they've proven themselves to us over a course of an apprentice period. So they can manage four shooters. And then we've got a range master that's watching 12 shooters that are being watched. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's layers in there. But if, if you're not as experienced, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one is probably the best thing. And, okay, so you got two people there. That's good. But just have one shooting at a time. Yeah. So you can focus on one, then you can turn and focus on the other. Um, if you've got more than that, remember, you can also kind of use them to help, I won't say coach, but they can certainly observe for safety. Yeah. And, and help with that. And, and learn as they stand by and, and see you correct, correct the other shooters, stand here, move this, you know, all right. that. Well, when we'll have folks come take a class, and they're already experienced shooters, they're firearms instructors and so on. Well, I don't really need this basic course. Well, back to what you said, and I heard Louis say that uh, about you can never get too much of the basics. If nothing else, watch other trainers and see how how they correct errors. Everybody teaches differently. Everybody learns differently. But if you watch all these different uh, good trainers, you can pick up ideas. You can see, oh, I didn't see that. How how in the world did he, and, and you start looking for those things, and that makes you a stronger trainer as well. So let's say you get to go take a class. You, you as this 
family trainer. You get to go take a class. Well, when Relay One's shooting and you're back loading, how about you pile a bunch of bullets in your pocket and you stand near the firing line and you load those magazines and drink your water while you're watching those instructors coach those students so you can steal every joke, every idea, every method that they're using and it'll make you better so you can better teach your wife, your kids, your friends, your neighbors, whoever it happens to be. And I was going to talk about the term you use is training scars. Yeah. And I love the concept of uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect Perfect practice practice makes perfect. Talk a little bit about that. And it kind of goes back to knowing what you're doing and making sure you're teaching it. They say it takes two or three thousand proper repetitions to really burn things into your brain so you can do it at a level of near at least conscious competence, if not unconscious competence. So if you if you screw up and do it wrong, well, you've got to do it right again many, many more times to erase that training scar. So, again, that's where it goes back to taking it easy, going slow. Um, so you're learning the methodologies so it can become smooth and you want it to be smooth. And as it smooths out, you're better. You're a little quicker. Um, you're more accurate because you're not. If, if you drive a stick shift, when you first learned how to drive that <laughs> stick stick shift, it's comical, right? Yeah. How the car's jerking as you're trying to, uh, you know, get it into, you know, take off from first gear, or maybe you're trying to hold it on a hill with the clutch. <laughs> yeah. But a year or two into it, you're you're changing the radio, you're drinking a cup of coffee, you're steering with your with your knee while you're while you're shifting, yeah. uh, and so on, and it's smooth as can be. Because you've had those many, many proper repetitions. There were bad ones in there first, (laughs) but you got past those and learned the right way to do it. And and shooting is the same way, whether it's up, look, focus out on the target, focus back on the front sight, take that slack out of the trigger, press on through once you meet that resistance, gun goes boom, ease that trigger out to reset, refocus on that front sight. Well, as you're thinking about that, it's real choppy, it's, it's real slow. But after a bit, not so much. I, I don't play golf. I've tried. You know, when I was sheriff, other sheriffs wanted to play golf. So I'd try to play along here. And if so, Rusty Hart was, was a, a, a good sheriff, and he's matter of fact, I think he's going to run for sheriff again <laughs> over in, in Fountain County, Indiana. And he's a big golfer. And if he would stand behind me and whisper sweet nothings into <laughs> me, into my ear of, Stay, holding my feet the right way, the hands on the club, look at the ball, and he talked me through step by step. Sometimes I'd hit it reasonably straight or reasonable distance. The problem is I didn't give a damn. <laughs> right? Okay, it was fun. Yeah. I, just let me drive the cart. Yeah. Because um, I, I don't care. But shooting I care about because it's going to save my life. And I also, golf's relaxing to him. Shooting is relaxing to me, as to you. It's, yeah. it, it's great sport. So... You've got to get to that point of either conscious competence, I know what I'm doing wrong, so I can fix it, or unconscious competence where you aren't thinking about it, and and it magically happens. Talk a little bit about targets. Typically, uh, certainly at Gunsight and and Thunder Ranch and all the places like that, police department, the military, we're shooting at silhouettes. Um, Do you think a beginner should be started out on a bullseye, or just throw some old cans out there, or do you think silhouettes are okay or what's your thoughts on that you know there, there's nothing wrong with a paper plate it's an eight inch circle and what's the size of the chest in a in, in most tar- humanoid type targets up in that upper chest about an eight inch circle so don't, you don't even spend a lot of money index cards and paper plates right and you could do that take a take a sharpie and put a, a, a dot on that paper plate and start working from there but again, it's going to be slow fire. A bullseye would work, but it's not like you've got to put it on that X ring every time. Let's start out slow. Now, you've seen me do this many times with brand new shooters where I'd bet a snicker bar <laughs> that in 15 shots, I'll have them touching bullet holes. Now, it's very slow fire, and oftentimes it's my finger pressing the trigger and things like that, but it works. And all I'm doing is all I would do is take a Sharpie and put a mark on that target, and that's what they'd aim at. And once you can get them to do that, 
their confidence level soars in themselves and in you as their teacher. So, yes, silhouettes are great, and all these exotic targets are great, but there's nothing wrong with a plain old white index card or an old bill envelope <laughs> um, and, and an 8-inch paper plate, and that will probably do what you want. If you want to get a little bit more exotic, take an old piece of cardboard, take an Amazon box, and cut a circle in the Amazon box, and your goal is to shoot through the hole. No, you don't get the, the good feeling of the bullet hole, but if you, <laughs> if you don't hit through the hole, you're hitting the cardboard, that's kind of embarrassing, because mm -hmm. then you do have that bullet hole. It's called a negative target. And then as you start, want to make it more challenging, make the hole smaller or make them different shapes. Think Lucky Charms, hearts and moons and stars, right? <laughs> Cut all these exotic shapes through there as you're wanting to challenge that new shooter. Don't start out with that. Start out with the paper plate, just a plain old white paper plate, and, and keep it simple. Uh, playing cards, they're not, not shooting through the edge. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, shooting through a, a playing card. You can also... Uh, uh, look online. There's other different targets as they need more challenges. There's a dot torture. And they're just targets you can print off and, and put on a staple on a piece of cardboard. So, but start out slow and easy. <clears throat> you want them to be successful so they want to come back again yeah. and not think, oh, God. That's like me and golf. Oh, God, I don't want to go back <laughs> in that golf course. Just let me drive the cart. I'll, is there a cooler? I'll drive the cooler around. <laughs> exactly. And what is it you say about golf courses anyway? It is a waste of a perfectly good unknown distance rifle range. <laughs> exactly. So there, there is a lot of resources out there. Of course, the NRA is available. Uh, in our area, we have the 4-H shooting sports. Right. Talk about some of the ones you know of that are, are good ways if people want to get involved in, in formal training that you could direct them to. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned that NRA is kind of a standard in there, and you can get some certifications, which also helps protect you because yeah. you got to think liability also. Um, Appleseed Project is a good thing, shooting with 22s and kids. Sport Shooting Sport also is, is teaching kids. Um, depending on where you are in the country, there are also some local trainers that can help you out. Here in the Indianapolis area, Guy Relford, the gun guy on WIBC, yeah. what a great guy. He offers some training opportunities. So if you think you've got a little bit of, of a knack for this and your friends and your neighbors are coming to you, maybe you should spend a little bit of money. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, but find one of these half a day or one day classes or get involved with those NRA classes and see what else you can pick up to, to make you, it, it'll do nothing, if nothing else, make you a stronger shooter. And I think that's a point we probably should have hit earlier on is if you're going to teach people, not only do you have to be able to shoot, you have to instruct. It's a two-part deal. And we've all been to classes uh, where we've seen people that were tremendous shooters and they can't instruct their way out of a wet paper sack. And vice versa, some folks that maybe aren't the strongest shooter in the world, but they are just fantastic instructors and they can get the most out of their students. But you still need to be able to shoot. Yeah. So you've got to be able to, you may not have to be Jerry, yeah. right? but um, you've still got to be able to hit. If you're a left-handed shooter, I want to be able to shoot your gun left-handed reasonably well. So when you say these sights are off and I take your gun with my support hand and shoot it and it's within reason, it's like, I, I don't think it's the sights. I, I think we need to, to work with you. Yeah. So you've got to be able to do that too. So. Make yourself a stronger shooter. You know, something else I'd suggest is doing some reading on how guns work, yeah. how, what the cycle of operation is. I've done that where I've taken uh, our issued gun was a 1911, where I take it apart and I put it together. As I'm doing it, I'm showing the student, the deputies, this is how the gun works. And some of them, you could see the light bulb, the epiphany happen of, oh, so that's why if I do this, my shot goes here. Yep. Yes. So have an understanding. Shooting is physics and geometry. I know that was longer ago <laughs> for some of you than others, but, but that's what it is. And so you've got to have some grasp of that, too, not just, not just marksmanship fundamentals. Yeah. No, I'll tell you what, if you've got questions, do I want you to come to Gunside or, or our friend Clint Smith at Thunder Ranch or 
some of these other great trainers around here, Tom Givens and and uh, uh, Dave Spaulding. Yes, we I, I do. But if you got a question on, hey, I've got a problem with a new shooter, and I heard I heard you on the Guns podcast. Shoot me an email. I'll give you the best answer I can. I won't guarantee it'll it'll be the right answer, <laughs> but I'll, I'll sure try for you. Yeah. If you just email me at Ken at gunsite.com, say again, Ken at gunsite.com, I got this new shooter, what would you suggest? I'll, I'll get back with you in a day or so and, and give you at least what I think my opinion is. Something to think about, too, if you're training people, even as a non-professional, as a favor, if something bad happens, you're on the hook. You were teaching them. You are. You were teaching them. You've got some liabilities there. Um, but let's even go another step back. You know anything about trauma med? Yeah. What are you going to do to stop that leak for 20 minutes till the professionals get there? So maybe you need to start thinking about taking some, some classes and the use of Israeli battle dressings and tourniquets and quick clock gauze and and things like that. And you also need to have that plan in mind. Let's go before that. What if something does happen? Who's going to call 911? Who's going to stay with, with the uh, person who's hurt? Who's going to run back out to the road to meet the first responder that's coming in to lead them where you are in the woods doing your target practice? Yeah. Then you also might want to talk to your insurance agent um, to see, hey, if I'm shooting with a friend and something bad happens, have I got any coverage? Because that can get real expensive real fast. Even though it's your best friend, um, stranger things have happened. Well, the bottom line is, as, as we've said, it's an honor to be asked to teach. But I hope we've also pointed out it's a thinking person's occupation. Yes, it is. And it's not just a matter of loading a gun and handing it to somebody and saying, there, shoot the target. Yeah, yeah. Loading holster. Six <laughs> live rounds. Um, I remember those days at the yeah, academy. Yes. Uh, it, when, before my time on the police department. Hey, you're a pretty good shooter. Why don't you take new guy out out to the dump, see if he can shoot any of the rats? That's exactly how it works. <laughs> exactly. And people can look and listen to us and say we're crazy, but that's how it that's works. That's exactly. You can kind of shoot. You can show him how. Yep. That's not necessarily the case. So, folks, really, if I, if I could stress one thing in here, going right back to the first thing I said, and you just hit on it, too. Your friend has come to you and asked you to help them learn how to save their life. The honor and respect they're showing you is great. You owe that back to them as well to do the best job you can. Well, how can people find out more about Gunsight Academy? <laughs> www.gunsight.com. We're the oldest and largest shooting academy privately owned in the world. We're 3,200 acres. We're in the high desert in northern Arizona. It's Disneyland with guns. And it's, you know, like I say, at the, all those Facebook lives, hey, when are you, you coming to gun, gun site? <laughs> Had to jump in there. Well, Ken, thank you for taking time out. I think this is a pretty important topic, and I think you distilled that down very well. So thank you for that, and uh, I think it's time we relax. Time for bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed my chat with Ken and picked up a few pointers for the next time you're teaching a new shooter. And yes, the bourbon was smooth. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first in the business, and we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast catcher, YouTube, and of course, at GunsMagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com and AmericanCop.com. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, 1791 Gun Leather. Visit them at 1791gunleather.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>